Welcome to our virtual session at STAGE's Promising Practices Conference. My name is Jody Drum and my teammate is Donna McLean, and we are regional coaches for Georgia's tier system of supports for students. The focus of our session is on integrating teaming structures such as MTSS and PBIS to improve academic and behavioral outcomes for students. By meeting our objectives at the end of this session, you should be able to understand the value of an implementation team, gain insight into the why, why integrate, determine readiness for strategic integration of teams, become, become familiar with the steps to strategically integrate teams, and to identify and mitigate potential barriers to integration. First things first. Let's begin with implementation teams and implementation science. The information we plan to share with you today is rooted in implementation science or connecting the research, what has been demonstrated to be effective to the practice, what it is that we do. Have you ever adopted a program or practice and struggled to implement it as intended? Perhaps you were able to implement it as intended, but struggled to do so consistently or to sustain the practice. If you reflect back on that experience, what was the gap? What was missing between knowing what to do and actually doing it in your classroom, school, or district? The National Implementation Research Network, or NERM, in partnership with a Technical Assistance Center, the State Implementation and Scaling Up of Evidence-Based Practices, seeks to address this gap by providing frameworks to create conditions that facilitate implementation and sustainability of evidence-based practices. From their work, they developed five frameworks to support implementation efforts. We will briefly touch on two of these frameworks today, implementation teams and implementation stages. If you're interested in learning more or you're seeking tools to help your district or schools successfully carry out and sustain an evidence-based practice, embedded in this slide are the links to the NERN website and the active implementation hub. One of the overarching frameworks for successful and sustainable implementation is implementation teams. Implementation teams help close that research to practice gap by providing that internal support structure that moves the evidence-based practice, program, or innovation through the stages of implementation. This may be a good time to add a bit of a side note. Instead of saying practice, program, or innovation, each time I want to refer to the what, what is being implemented, I'm going to just use the term practice. And when I refer to a practice, I want you to know that I'm referring to a practice that is evidence-based, research-based, or deemed to be a validated practice. So let's get back to implementation teams and approaches to implementation. Implementation teams are accountable for making it happen. Approaches that let implementation happen are approaches that leave it to administrators, teachers, or to the district staff to make use of the research findings on their own. Approaches that help implementation happen are approaches that provide things like manuals or websites to help those who need to implement make it happen. Both of these approaches have been found to be insufficient for implementing and sustaining the full and effective use of evidence-based practices. The third approach is called making it.
To make it happen, implementation teams work with various individuals and groups to help them think about the need for change, get ready for change, and to actively participate in the change process. They create conditions and initiate activities to support the buy-in process. Why do, we do, why do we need to do this? They work with others to get ready for the change. They facilitate, create, and or develop the needed supports to initiate the practice and implement it as intended. Implementation teams actively participate in the change process. They actively build their own capacity to support the implementation of selected innovations. 80% of the work of an implementation team is around creating readiness for the new practice program or innovation. Let's take a moment to pause and think. First, I want you to think about your current teaming structure. What teaming structures are in place in your district or school? Do you have teams that look at data to inform decisions? What kind of data are they looking at? Academic data, behavior data, attendance, mental health, culture and climate, health and wellness. If you have teams that are looking at data, extend your thinking. What are the benefits to strategically integrating teams within your school or district? What are the potential barriers? I encourage you to pause the video and think about these questions. During the pause and think, were you able to extend your thinking and consider whether there were teams maybe teams with similar or the same function that could be melded together? As you thought of the data each team uses to drive or inform decision-making, were there opportunities to build efficiency? What would it look like if the behavior team considered academic data or the attendance team considered behavior data when addressing the needs of students? And if combining or integrating one team with another came to mind, what did you consider to be the benefits? What were the barriers? So you may be asking, why try? Why should you try to strategically integrate teams? When deciding which teams make the most sense to integrate and in what order to integrate, consider the following. The interactive nature of academics and behavior can lend itself to an integrated approach. Teams that consider both academic and behavior data can be more effective in addressing student needs. Strategically integrating teams that serve the same or similar functions protects resources in terms of time and how staff members are utilized. When the composition of each individual team varies, integrating the two teams allows for sharing of skill-based knowledge and builds capacity for problem solving across grade levels, schools, and districts. Another overarching framework to guide implementation of a new practice, program, or innovation are the stages of implementation, exploration, installation, initial implementation, and full implementation. Although these stages appear to be linear, especially when they are listed as a bulleted list, the stages are iterative and recursive in practice. At the onset of this session, I asked you to think of a practice, a program, or innovation that your district or school adopted. For example, your district or school may have adopted the language of MTSS to encompass more than just RTI, and you may have partnered with Godot to implement PBIS. If the adoption has been recent, you may be at the exploration or installation stage with one or both. You could also be at the exploration or installation stage if you've been implementing this practice for, let's say, three to five years. After a period of trial and learning, a district or school might return to the exploration or installation stage. It's okay to say we missed this so we need to go back. At the exploration stage, take the time needed to engage in readiness activities 
and secure resources to build that supportive infrastructure. Adopt the mantra, you can pay now or pay later. As exploration progresses and resource needs emerge, the installation stage usually begins. It is at this stage that teams, district and school leaders and staff prepare for initial implementation. As that first cohort of teachers and staff complete training and begin implementation of the new practice, teams engage with school leaders and staff in a problem solving process to quickly detect and mitigate or eliminate barriers while developing implementation capacity. Full implementation is difficult to achieve and sustain. Researchers have found that it takes two to four years to move from the start of exploration to full implementation. And a district team may achieve full implementation can find itself back in exploration and installation stages because changes in the environment can cause setbacks, such as team members come and go, there are changes in leadership, a shift in the political context or the environment. Is the timing right? Are your teams ready to integrate? Just as there is no ideal team makeup or number of teams in each school, there is no magic, no ideal solution for how to integrate teams to increase efficiency and effectiveness. A few logical places to start are adapting existing teams, integrating across domains, such as integrating into one team, an attendance team, an RTI team, and a behavior team. Integrating teams who review data and problem solve across your system of tiered support and intervention. Before we delve any further into strategic intervention of teams, let's take a brief look at teaming structures. Thank you, Jody. Now we're going to review teaming structures. When teaming structures are being developed, starting at the top with the district leadership usually works best. The district leadership team provides most of the infrastructure needed for successful implementation. For example, funding and staffing are often managed by district leadership. Additional teaming structures include school level teams and grade level teams. These teams may review data without a focus on individual students. In fact, this is best practice so that the focus is not on the students, but on the factors beyond the students, which can impact their performance. Reviewing data in this manner allows team members to identify problems in instruction and curriculum, which may then be addressed by the team. Team members may decide to provide additional resources to strengthen the Tier 1 instruction and curriculum, for example. This is especially important if Tier 1 is not meeting all the academic and behavioral needs of at least 80% of the students. Then, individual student needs are discussed at the SST level and the IEP level. A copy of this chart has been provided as a handout. You may want to refer to it now. This chart shows how teaming structures might look across tiered supports. For example, team members in Tier 1 review benchmark screening and state assessments to answer the question, is the core programming meeting the academic and or behavioral needs of at least 80% of our student population? If your team decides that at least 80% of the population's needs are not being met, then the team needs to focus on making improvements to the core curriculum. The team does not need to think about improving or adding interventions at Tier 2s and Tier 3 until the core curriculum is robust enough to meet the needs of at least 80% of the population. At Tier 2, team members review progress monitoring, ODRs, and behavior point sheets to answer the question, are the targeted supports meeting the academic or behavioral needs of students receiving targeted interventions? At Tier 3, which is more intensive, data from di academic diagnostic assessments, Anecdotal and observational data and progress monitoring data are used to answer the question, 
are the intensive supports meeting the academic and behavioral needs of students with the most intensive needs? The most individualized team members review data collected from IEP and 504 goals, as well as other sources to answer the question, are the specialized educational supports and services appropriate? And are they meeting the academic and behavioral needs of the student? Now, take a minute to think about teaming structures you may already have in place, such as the school PBIS leadership team. This slide provides an idea of the possible team members this team might include. What are some other teams your school or district has in place? Are any of them similar enough to warrant integration? For example, do you have a district improvement team? Do you have a school improvement team? What other teams do you have in place? Here's another slide taken from Georgia's PBIS unit. The first section provides information about team composition, while the second section includes suggestions for team operating procedures. In this case, the, the tier one team is expected to meet at least monthly with a regular meeting format. Minutes are maintained and team members have defined roles. In addition, a current action plan is in place. Now, we're going to discuss how teams might be integrated. In other words, what step, steps will we need to take to move forward? We can consider adapting existing teams. If your school or district is considering integrating some teams, one of the first things you need to do is complete an inventory of current teams. List all the teams and then for each team, identify the purpose, List the team members and include the meeting frequency. You'll need all this information so that you can compare the teams accurately. In some cases, you may want to consider how the teams focus on students. By that, I mean you may want to consider whether the team focuses on groups of students or on individual students. Think about the four stages of program implementation. You will recall that Jody mentioned these earlier when she discussed NERN. The stages are exploration, installation, implementation, and full implementation. When integrating, at least one team needs to be at the full implementation stage or very close to full implementation. For example, one district in our NPSS cohorts had a well-established PBIS team. So they use this team as a starting point for their NPSS team since it was already in place and was fully functional. The structure used for that team was easily morphed into an MTSS team by adding additional members with more academic expertise. The functions of each team need to be clearly defined and known to all other teams. Developing a chart and sharing the information is one way to achieve this objective. An additional handout titled, Work Smarter, Not Harder from Georgia's PBIS team has been provided to you as you may want to use the format shared in that document to assess your current teams. Another thing to consider during the initial stages of integration is the order for integration. Districts will find it easiest to integrate at the SST or individual student level. Then consider integrating at tiers two and three. The last place to integrate is tier one. Sometimes the amount of data available to re review at Tier 1 may seem overwhelming, and this task becomes easier to do if integration has already occurred at the other tiers. By this time, you've determined if your district or school is ready to integrate teams, and you understand the need to have an implementation team in place to guide the process. You have completed an inventory of current teams with corresponding information, so now you may begin thinking about barriers. In the next few slides, we'll cover some comments made by districts when integration is being considered.
All districts and schools have teams in place that are mandated. In other words, you don't have a choice. These teams must be in place. Be sure to include these teams in the list mentioned and consider whether adding additional team members could be done to develop an MTSS team. For example, sometimes the PLC team may be used as a starting point, especially if data is reviewed and is included as part of the PLC. Some districts have said that it is difficult to integrate teams because there is too much data to cover at one time when reviewing both academic and behavioral data. If this is the case for your school or district, the same team members may meet regularly, but the discussion may need to alternate between discussing behavioral data in one session and academic data in another, another session. If teams in your school or districts are set up based on the level of tiered supports, then alternating between the focus on tiers two and three may work for your district. Alternating the focus between tier one and tier two could be another way to allow the same team members to participate in both meetings. When the integrated team initially meets, you want to make sure that all meetings are successful, but the first one needs to go as smoothly as possible. After the meeting is scheduled, consider some of these steps to ensure a successful meeting. The meeting should have a clear purpose and is often helpful to establish norms. Norms used by some teams include the following, start and end on time, no side conversations, no cell phones, agenda sent 24 hours in advance, etc. If the meeting is going to be long, be sure to schedule breaks for biological needs and put these breaks in the agenda so that attendees know when they will occur. In addition, it is also helpful to have a parking place to keep ideas that come up that are important but need to be discussed later so that the conversation stays on track. Identifying and assigning roles is often helpful to ensure someone is keeping up with the time and to maintain meeting notes. An agenda is helpful for keeping everyone on track and also serves as a formal record of the meeting. An action plan needs to be developed so that everyone knows what steps need to be taken for improvement and the action plan should include the tasks along with who is responsible and a timeline. To summarize, we would like to share some final thoughts with you. Remember, aligning or integrating teams will result in a more efficient process in most cases. This allows for more effective use of team members' time and additional resources, such as meeting space. In most settings, full integration will take time and you may even run into some resistance. So be patient. Lastly, we wanted to share this quote with you from McIntosh and Goodman's book, Integrated Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, Blending RTI and PBIS. Find the balance between effectiveness and efficiency, landing at the right number and configuration of each school's needs so that teams can find the time to meet and get through their agendas. In other words, you don't want to integrate just for the sake of integrating. You will only want to consider this if it results in increased effectiveness and efficiency for the teams in your district or school. Only you and your colleagues can determine the number of teams you need and the kinds of teams you need to get the critical work done for students. And last, here's our contact information. Jody and I have enjoyed our time with you today, and we hope that it has been helpful. Thank you for attending our presentation. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact us by phone or email. And this slide serves as a reminder that the MTSS supports at the Georgia Department of Education have been provided by a SPDIG grant from the U.S. Department of Education. We hope you continue to enjoy the rest of STAGE's Promising Practices Conference 2022. We hope you have a good day. Bye.